this uh, lecture on Augustine and Pelagius and uh, the Pelagian controversy. Um, really, this is focused on kind of anthropology. So you'll notice thus far we've we've kind of talked about the authority in the church. So we've talked about scripture, we've talked about um, apostolic succession, and then we've talked about some of the big issues dealing with Christology and who is the person of Jesus Christ, uh, which leads then into the doctrine of the Trinity. And so early Christians are trying to uh, kind of figure these things out and give language to their understanding of who God is and what it means to be Christian. Um, and they're doing so kind of using some of the, the categories and language of, of Greek philosophy, as we've talked about. But it's also important to see that they are uh, trying to be faithful to what Scripture is talking about. Um, and, and so in this lecture, what we want to focus on is um, our humanity. And what is the state of our humanity? How do we make sense of what it means to be made in the image of God, uh, and at the same time, the, the impact of sin upon our humanity. And that is really what this Pelagian controversy uh, was all about. So um, it begins with a British monk named uh, Pelagius. And Pelagius is concerned uh, because he believes that Christians are becoming too lax. And so again, we need to put him in his context. He is a monk. So when we think of monasticism, which we'll talk about uh, you know, here in a little bit, so Pelagius is a part of this monastic life in which they are kind of seeking to live faithfully. And what he sees is that people are being lax about their faith, about morality. Uh, and he thinks it's a, a theological problem. Uh, and some of it has to do with the way that we think about sin. Uh, and so it's important to, to put him in his context as I read now um, a writing from Pelagius, which I think gives us a picture into the issues that Pelagius is concerned about. So he says this, Instead of regarding the commands of our illustrious king as a privilege, we cry out at God in the scornful sloth of our hearts and say, this is too hard and difficult. We cannot do it. We are only human and hindered by the weakness of the flesh, blind folly and presumptuous blasphemy. We ascribe to the God of knowledge the guilt of twofold ignorance, ignorance of his own creation and of his own commands, as if, forgetting the weakness of men, his own creation, he has laid upon men commands which were, we are, they are unable to bear. And at the same time, God forgive us, we ascribe to the just one up unrighteousness and cruelty to the Holy One. The first, by complaining that he has commanded the impossible. The second, by imagining that a man will be condemned by him for what he could not help. So that, the blasphemy of it, God is thought of as seeking our punishment rather than our salvation. No one knows the extent of our strength better than he who gave us that strength. He has not willed to command anything impossible, for he is righteous, and he will not condemn a man for what he could not help, for he is holy. So what Pelagius is saying is that uh, to have a picture of God uh, who is going to punish humanity for something that they couldn't help, for seeing, uh, for example, the commands of the Beatitudes or the commands of the Sermon on the Mount as something that is beyond our hum human capacity, that somehow shows that we are sinful and that, that we deserve wrath or punishment, Pelagius doesn't agree with this because he sees that God would know that we couldn't do this um, and so why would God then expect us to live a life that we are incapable of, uh, of living? And so again, for Pelagius, the, his argument is based upon an understanding of who God is, but also it, it pushes into thinking about what it means to be a human being. And so Pelagius believes that every human being is like Adam, that humans aren't born sinful. We're not, um, we, we don't bear the, the guilt of Adam's sin. Uh, because it's unjust to, to be held accountable for somebody else's sin in the past. Uh, his argument is that every human is capable of living a uh, a perfect uh, a perfect life. That we are capable of of obeying the commands that God has um, has given us. So Augustine responds to this by um, taking on some of the claims that Pelagius makes. Uh, he does believe that humans have freedom and free will. Pelagius is making the case that if humans are incapable of doing good or, or doing what God commands, then how can humans be free? And Augustine would argue that no, humans are free, um, and that it's not God who's causing evil. It is not God who's forcing us to, to live this way. God hasn't created us this way. Uh, and, and he sees evil and sin as a twisting of something that is good. And so Augustine looks at the human condition and says that God created us good and capable of living a faithful life, of living a spiritual life. But what he sees is that in Adam, a distortion has happened, that the sin of Adam has distorted humanity, that we're wrongly directed. Uh, and it's in that wrong being wrongly directed that we are unable or uh, incapable of 
living as we were intended to live. So what Augustine would say is we're still free. We live in freedom. We choose to act and live and do. But now what he's saying is that because we have been corrupted by sin, we've been distorted by sin, now in our freedom, we're wrongly directed. Um, Augustine refers to this as the sin is the curvature of the self in and upon the self. We're, we're caught in this um, way of life that we can't quite break out of. So Augustine believes that uh, humans have indeed inherited Adam's sin. Um, but this inheritance comes in the corruption of the human will. So what Adam and Eve have done is they've, they've sent humanity on a certain trajectory. The, our will has been misdirected. And therefore, though we freely choose to act and do, because our will has been bent now in a particular way, and Augustine would say that's inwardly, it's a kind of a selfish thing, um, the will, human will has been corrupted. So this is what total depravity really means. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are totally evil. What it means is humanity has been corrupted or bent or distorted in a way that instead of living the way God has created us to live, we are consistently living in ways that dehumanize ourselves, dehumanize our neighbor, and we're caught in this cycle of sin. Um, and for Augustine, it's only by God's grace that we are able to break out of this. It is only by God becoming a human being, sacrificing himself, that, that God breaks that open and restores our humanity through grace so that we can now live into the life that God calls us to live into. So it's important to recognize how this discussion about uh, the human person is going to move throughout the history of Christianity. We, we're going to see this in Calvinism, that it's going to emphasize this Augustinian uh, focus of total depravity um, versus uh, others who are going to reject Calvinism and believe that humans have capability and have free will and have freedom. Uh, and so it really boils down to this question of what it means to be human and how we understand the impact of sin upon our humanity. Now, Pelagianism is, is rejected by the church, but I always think it's important we, we recognize um, these, even our heretics within their context, what was it that he was after? And for him, it was that looking at, at, at Christians and seeing that they were already becoming lax, that we, we would say, oh, well, we're sinful, and that becomes justification to live however we'd like to live. And he was pushing Christians to say, no, we have a responsibility to live into faith and into this spiritual life. Uh, and so in that way, it's important to see how he's after something good. But what Augustine emphasizes is, and, and speaks to, is the human condition. And, and that it's it's in this kind of human fallenness now, our misdirectedness, that we can make sense of evil and sin, but also make sense of the grace that God gives us uh, in, in, in Jesus Christ.